Okay, most of what we are going to talk about today, um, actually, Fort, could you do me a favor? Come up here, see if I'm in the picture. Pencil. I already have a pencil. Good. Am I, am I kind of in the picture? Uh, not quite. Yeah, not that, really. That, perfect. Close enough. Okay. Um, I, know, I know everybody's here, but we'll still record it just in case. So, um, And that way your folks can look at it too. So mostly what we're going to talk about today is kind of things we really didn't get to that are big questions that might be in your mind. I'm going to share some of the big questions I know people have asked me before in the past. And you're free to write down a question if it crosses your mind um, during the session. I'll take those that way. Um, unless you're the only one that writes it down. People won't know who, who, who it came from. because. Um, but if you want to say it out loud, that's fine. Um, if there are questions you really would rather talk about one-on-one, -on -one, one of the last things we're going to do between now and Easter is to find a time um, to meet with everybody individually so that we can make sure you know exactly what you want to do in terms of your decision on baptism or confirmation. Okay, So we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, but we'll talk about it a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. That way you can express your um, desires to me directly, and I think I've told you before, it is perfectly fine to go through confirmation classes and then get to the end and say, you know, I just don't think I'm quite ready to say yes to this. I'll give you an example. I may have told you this before. Um, when um, couples come to me um, planning to get married, we have to meet with them as a pastor and kind of prepare them and talk about, well, here's the things you're going to have to say. This is a marriage vow. This is what it means. I want you to be sure and know that this is something that is, that is right for you. Now, as a pastor, I would guess, I would guess 90% of the time, they've pretty well made up their mind. They've picked a date. They want to get married. So they come and we talk and they decide yes. But about 10% of the time, something maybe happens and as we talk they say you know maybe we should hold off on this and to me it's really important that's not a failure that is that is probably a good thing does, does that make sense to y'all it's, it's a good thing that they kind of decided hey we're not ready for that I'd a lot rather somebody decide that before the wedding than after the wedding, right? Because it's a big decision and you want to make sure it is correct. It'd be kind of like if you picked a college out, you just saw an article about it and you said, that's where I'm going, and you sent them all your application fee, you sent them the fall tuition, you showed up and you said, this place is terrible. I wish I'd known that. You know, well, that's a hard way to learn. It's a lot better to go visit the college first then find out is this somewhere I want to go. The biggest confirmation class I ever had, we had 43 kids in the class. It was kind of crazy because that's too many people to be in a class, but we survived. And I think 37 out of the 43 made a decision to um, make a faith decision to give their life to the Lord and to be a part of the family of faith. And about six of them said, well, this was okay, but I'm just not quite ready for that. And I, I tried to be real careful because it sounds like you're doing something terrible, but it's not. This is a matter of timing for something you're ready for, just like my example of the couple getting married. Does that make sense to everybody? Good? Lanny? Emery? Kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's have a little word of prayer, then I'm going to share some of the questions I have, and then we'll sort of turn it into a free-for-all for any questions that you have. Dear God, I thank you for the time of growth that we have had, that we've been able to learn more about your plan in our lives, that we have seen you at work. Lord, it's been about two years of pandemic, and none of us could ever imagine how much our life will have changed. And God, I know some people have drawn farther away from you because of pandemic. But it's kind of like a miracle that some people have actually grown closer to you because of pandemic. 
because we see that so often that sometimes stressful times or hard times or even times of disappointment can possibly bring us closer to you as we learn to trust you and as we learn to remember what your promises are all about. I pray for each one in this room that as we gather we can we can indeed be about a lifelong learning experience. Be with us tonight as we get closer and closer to Confirmation Day that, that our questions might be answered and that we might feel good about our faith choices we make. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me tell you another thing, one thing about confirmation, because it happens at about the early teenage years um, thing, um, truly, you're, you're probably going to get to a time where you say, I sort of understand most of this and some of this is confusing. You, one would think that your lifelong journey is just going to know more and more answers. Because, you know, if it comes to math or English, the older we get, the more answers we know. There's an exception to that when it comes to our faith, because what happens is I get new answers and I get new questions. Let me see if I can explain what that means. If you add 10 years to your age, so most of you would be, I guess all of you would be in your 20s in 10 years, I can pretty well predict there are some things you wonder about now that 10 years from now you'll say, oh, I got that. But I can also predict that 10 years from now you will be wondering about things and asking questions that you hadn't even thought of yet. So it's kind of like you trade one bag of questions for another bag of questions. And some people think, well, that's terrible. If I'm a Christian, I will have all the answers my personal opinion, and I would say in our type of church, maybe that's more so the case, in our type of church, we're not going to tell you you've got to have it all figured out, okay? Because God is like always part mystery. And, and, it, and it's not like learning your multiplication tables where, okay, now I've got that down. Don't have to worry about that anymore. It's not like that. It's more like a relationship. Well, a relationship's a pretty good way to put it because, you know, um, the people you love, you learn more about them, but you also have new questions about them and your relationship's always changing. So it is with our relationship with Jesus and the Bible. You will pick up the Bible in 10 years. You will open it and you'll say, oh my goodness. I used to read that and it made sense, but now it's really making me wonder because it's connecting to things that are new to you. Are we making sense here? Okay. Um, I, I, I want to say that because some people freak out when they have new questions and they think, well, maybe God's mad at me because I'm asking questions about God. God is not mad at you <laughs> for asking questions about God. That's a very, very normal thing. So. Okay, as I think about the type of questions that people ask the most, probably the number one thing, not just in confirmation classes, but in, in adult classes too, is um, how do we explain terrible things happening to good people? I don't know if that question has ever crossed your mind. But sometimes people, they say, oh, okay, I'm going to try to live for God I'm going to pray, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to read my Bible, and then I, I really believe my life's going to be better as a result, and they do that, and then um, something kind of terrible happens, and they say, wait a minute, God promised he was going to be with me and protect me, and look what happened. And the reactions people have are very different. Some people get angry at God. Some people get angry at themselves and they say, oh, I must have done something terrible. I must have done something terrible and now God is punishing me. So people come to all kind of conclusions. Um, some, here's the thing, here's, here's one I want you to think about. Do you think 
that God plans everything that happens or do sometimes just things happen? Do you believe God plans everything that happens or some things just happen? What do you think, Connor? A little bit of both. A little bit of both? Landon? A little bit of both, Emery? Mm, I guess both. Yeah? Better? Not sure? What can you say, not sure, Lee? It's really, really interesting that you all are thinking through these things right now, and um, these are the these are this is an example of the kind of question that you're probably going to float on through life. It's not like you're going to get your head one thing. Some people will absolutely say, "If it happened, God planned it." Okay, if I fell and broke my leg, well. Years ago, for some reason, God wrote it out. Pastor Robert's going to fall and break his leg, maybe, maybe to teach him a lesson or maybe because um, he was mean to the cat last week or something like that, so he's going to get revenge. So it's almost, you've heard of karma. That's not a Christian thing, but some people believe in karma. It's kind of like everything you do affects somebody else. A lot of people kind of have a karma, you know, and so that's where you get the question, what did I do to deserve this, okay? Let me say it's okay to ask that question, but when something terrible happens to you, which it will, happens to all of us, terrible things do happen, it's not going to be something you deserve. I can tell you, I can tell you that much, that... Um, Certainly, kind of like both of you said, there's a little bit of both in this. I kind of like Reed's answer that, yeah, there's some things, but, you know, most of all, sometimes things just happen. You know, people do fall and break their leg. And it's not necessarily God making me do that. Sometimes we just trip, right? Things, things happen. And... Um, one of the best, here's, here's an example of the two questions you can ask. One question you can ask is, what did I do to deserve that? That's kind of like beating up on yourself. It's like trying to be hard on yourself, saying, oh my gosh, I must have been a bad person for this to happen. Another thing to say is, okay, God, what can I learn in this? Because sometimes people learn a lot during the hardest times of life, they learn, um, they find strength they didn't have. They learn, they learn to be more compassionate to other people when they go through problems. Um, if you think about, here's a problem that doesn't happen to most people, but it's about as bad as you can get. For a mom and a dad, to have a little baby, and then the baby doesn't make it. Oh my goodness. There's probably nothing you can think of that would cause people more questions. And that's a perfect example of how some people are going to say, Oh, you know, I did something terrible two months ago and God's trying to get me. Well, there's a lot of things we don't know about life, but we do know God would not wish that pain on somebody. Um, one of the amazing things is that the people that can help a mom or dad most who've gone through that are people 
who've been through that themselves. That kind of makes sense when you think about it. Like, like if um, my wife and I had a baby and then that baby died, and then if there was another couple in town and they called us and said, hey, Betsy and Robert, let me, let me tell you, this happened to us three years ago. Can we go talk about it? It's like, because that person went through it, God can use them to almost do a miracle, but to, be, to bring a blessing to that person. So we don't get baptized or confirmed in order to make sure bad things never happen, because bad things do happen to everybody. But we do decide to grow in faith day by day so that when a bad thing does come, hopefully we're closer to God and we can learn to depend upon God and other people too. Um, one of the things I hope you'll know is that this church is um, filled with faith friends and of course a pastor. And whenever you go through something really rough, sometimes there's things you can't talk about with a lot of folks, but you don't have to talk about it with a lot of folks. You just need to find one or two persons that you can really talk to and that can really help you out. And pastors have to do that too. It's not, it's not like we have the magic because what we do for others, we need others to do for us as well. So pastors, we also have things happen in our life that we have to talk to folks and get some help on that. Okay, let's see another one. Oh, a lot of people ask, what do we believe about other religions? Okay, so um, the world is divided up into uh, major religions and then people with no religion. Probably the biggest religions in the world are Christianity and Islam and maybe Hinduism in India. Um, China is a huge country, but I don't think they have one huge major religion. There are Christians in China, there are Buddhists in China, and then there's people who have no religion. Japan also has some different religions. So uh, here's something Christians kind of disagree about a little bit. Some Christians say, you know, well, God only works with Christians. And all these other religions are um, terrible and stay away. <clears throat> There's nothing good going on there. Just keep your, keep your eye on our faith and stay away from everything else. Other Christians would say, oh, yeah, I definitely, definitely believe Christianity is the revealed word of God, but I believe God is working with other people too. And the presence of God might be there even though it's not what we call a Christian group. Hmm, what do you think about that? Any thoughts on what you personally believe there? It works through everybody. Works through everybody. Okay, I would, and, and, and I'll tell you where this came up one time for real is that um, somebody, uh, a Christian was once quoted as saying, well, if you're not a Christian, God doesn't hear your prayer. And Kind of like Lana. Personally, I disagreed with that. That it's not like God's got his little gang over here and forget about everybody, everybody else. That um, Jesus didn't come to slice and dice us and cut us apart from each other. Now, we do believe Jesus is the way. God didn't have 50 sons and daughters of God to be a savior. We believe in one savior. Um, but we also believe in the invisible spirit. And if you were to discover an island where there was no religion, where they hadn't got the Bible and all of that, and you were to go visit them, I bet you would find people who have God's spirit in them, you know? It's not like they're sitting there for thousands of years waiting for the Bible to show up. 
Because God is already there, kind of like Landon, Landon said. Now, um, that gets kind of tricky for us you know, on how we relate to other people. I was, in a, I was subbing in a class at high school, and um, this one guy started talking about how he didn't believe in a God. And it's kind of like everybody, all the you know, Christian kids circled around him. They weren't being mean, but they were kind of hitting him hard with other, other questions. And since I was wearing my sub hat and not my pastor hat, I kind of kept my mouth shut and just listened to them. But he was doing a pretty good job of saying why he believed what, what he believed, you know. And fortunately, most of the Christians were respectful. However, I have seen Christians be hateful to atheists, you know, or people who are not very religious, and it's, they, they kind of condemn them. So one of the things we can learn from is to look at how Jesus treated people. And if I had a friend who's an atheist, well, actually, I'll give you a real-life example. There's a guy that I think he's 24. He lives down the road from me, and he doesn't have a car, and he works at Cracker Barrel, and he has to, it's not that far, but you have to go along an interstate and a big highway and there's no sidewalks. So it's kind of a dangerous walk. Well, I told him, you know, I can't give you a ride every time, but you let me know if you need a ride. And um, I, I, I know enough to really wonder if he is Christian or Muslim or nothing. I'm not sure because he's his background is like all these different countries. He's he's got backgrounds from a lot of different countries. So he's a real interesting person. But my I kind of feel like my job is not to come and try to change his mind about who he is, but to show him kindness. And so when he says I need a ride, yeah, today I can't. No, sorry, can't tomorrow night, but I'll do my best. And then, and then get to know a little bit about him and what his beliefs are important to him rather than try to tell him, okay, you're stupid. I've got it figured out. You need to have the same ideas that I do. Does that make sense? That's, to me, that's, that's kind of how I roll on something like that. So, um, Here's one. This may not confuse you at all. This one, this one's very easy for me, but it does divide Christians, okay? So this is a Christian question. Some Christians believe that God decided before we were born whether we were going to be his child or not. So that if there's 100 people in the room, maybe God picked 40 of them and God said, okay, these are going to be my sons and daughters, and they're going to love me, and these others, they're kind of hopeless. Other folks believe that God does not pre-select us, but rather he invites all of us to be his son or his daughter, but he leaves the decision up to us. So he doesn't make us do anything. So, what fits your beliefs better? God pre-selects some, and you're just in, or God offers love to everybody, and then we have to choose. Pre-select or choose? Court? Um, choose. Choose. Pierce? Yeah, I think let us choose. Let us choose. Read. Choose. Choose. Let That's kind of a biggie, 
um, for us Methodists. So you're you're kind of in the right plot here in saying saying choose. I think, although again, I would be very respectful of a Christian friend who came to another another decision. Um, what would somebody say who doesn't believe that? They would say, they would say, you know, we're all born messed up. And our only hope is that God reaches out to us. And this person would say, I'm just grateful that God reached out to me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't pick it. It's kind of like being given a family. You don't pick your family. It's just a gift there. And so I just, I just praise God that I'm part of his family, not because I deserve it, but because he loved me and he chose me. And Robert, it makes it sound like you just, you're kind of bragging on yourself because you're saying you chose right. No, no. If you're, if you're part of God's chosen, it's only because God chose you. Well, the Bible gets us a little tricky here, like Michael was saying, because the Bible does talk about the fact that we're chosen. And what we believe, though, is that you can hold on to both. That you can hold on to the truth my friend was trying to say, that, which is that God chooses us, but we don't hold on to the truth that God gives up on other people. What ends up happening is if I see somebody whose life's really screwed up, imagine poor Landon. Poor Landon, his life is just so messed up. Everybody feels sorry for Landon because he's so wicked. And you know, I mean, the teachers just say, oh, poor Landon. The kids at school just say, oh, poor Landon, you know. Um, if I believe all of these things happen just because God planned it that way. And I'm going to say, poor Landon. God obviously didn't have him on his list. Boo-hoo. Good luck. Maybe we'll find out otherwise, but God's probably written him off. But in our faith, what we say is that God had a plan for all of us, even people who are kind of going through a messed up time in their life. And so I'm going to pray for Landon that, that hopefully he'll listen to God's plan for him. God doesn't make him say yes to him, but God invites him. And one of the things you'll see is that, that sometimes people wake up to God at a young age. Sometimes people wake up to God at a very old age. I think I've told you that story before about the man who was not going to live for very long, but he decided to receive Jesus at a very late time in his life. So things can happen at different times in our life, no doubt, no doubt about that. So, um, here's one. Are some sins too big to forgive? Can you mess up so bad that God's just going to say, well, I'm not going to forgive that. Will, will God forgive any sin? What do you think, man? Yes. Landon, Landon didn't stop and hesitate on that. He said, God, yes, can forgive any sin. Connor? Uh, all sins are equal, so yes. Okay, so it's not... A sin can outweigh a sin. I mean, if you have two sins, then you have one, but two overweighs it. But if you have one and one, it doesn't really matter. That's a tricky one. All sins are equal. We're going to come back and talk about that, because it's sort of, sort of yes and sort of no, you know? So um, it, it's very tricky. What about y'all? What do you think? I think you're all, you're all right. You're all correct on that one, you know. Forgiveness is bigger than anything. But there are sins that have greater consequences. Jesus helped us and confused us at the same time. Because he said, um, 
Well, you've heard it said don't murder, but I say don't get angry. You know, have you heard that before? That's in the Bible. Um, you've heard it said don't murder, but I say don't get angry. Are murder and anger equal? No. One's a product of the other. Oh, they're connected. I, I, actually, yeah, you know. Well, I will put it this way. If you get angry with me, Michael, please don't go ahead and murder me anyway, since, well, since I'm angry, might as well do that. So, yeah. I, I had the floor, all, all set up for you. <laughs> you were ready. Here's my opinion. Jesus didn't say that so that he would make murder out to be not a big thing. But Jesus, the reason Jesus said that was for people who thought too much of themselves and thought, well, I don't have many sins, you know. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute. Think about the things you do. You may not do this, but you may do that. And when Connor said all sins are the same, it's kind of like in that sense they are because all of us have sins that we need God's help with, okay? And nobody should trick themselves into thinking they don't need God's help just because I'm not like somebody else. Jesus even told a story about that where there were two people praying one day and one guy said, Dear God, I just thank you. I'm not like him. That was his prayer. It's kind of rude, isn't it? That was his prayer. Dear God, I'm glad I'm not like him. And the other guy got up there and prayed and said, Dear God, I need your mercy because I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, Now that one understood what prayer is and this one didn't. So Jesus taught us that lesson to understand that we all need to depend on that. So um, I used to have arguments with friends about that because they'd say, well, if you murder somebody, just say, dear Lord, forgive me. And if you go out and murder somebody again, just say it again. If you go out and murder somebody again, pretty soon you're a genocide, Sandra. Something's wrong here, you know? I mean, you're just kind of pretending. Um, and I didn't like my, my friend's answer, you know, but they were kind of saying, you know, anything can be forgiven but the other thing is that um, that that God certainly does want us not just to commit a sin and pray a prayer commit a sin pray a prayer but to learn how our life can change okay so yeah we do we all fall into sin every day and I pray every day Lord please forgive my sins I hope you do too um, but I also pray dear Lord help me to walk in in a new way. Help me to pay attention to you. That part of the Lord's Prayer we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So I'm um, trespassing. When we say trespassing, we think about going over into somebody's property without their permission. But Jesus meant it kind of like just going somewhere you shouldn't go and and crossing a line you shouldn't cross. So it's, it's like saying, forgive me my sins. Um, dear Lord, forgive my sins, but also help me to forgive other people's sins. That's the hard part sometimes. Have you ever had somebody, you don't have to answer, just think about it. You ever had somebody kind of do something wrong to you and you just couldn't forget it? It's like you always look at them differently. Sometimes it's hard to forgive. And so we ask Jesus not only to forgive us, but to help us learn to forgive others as well, too. But then it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So it's kind of like, now that I've been forgiven, Lord, help me walk in the right way. And help me not get over here or get over here, but walk in a healthy way here. So that's another thing we pray, is for God, God then to help us to do that. Here's one that comes up all the time. And there are Christians who believe that if you're going to be a Christian, you have to reject science. In other words, in science you learn about creation being I don't know how many years old. Pierce, do you know the latest theory on how old creation is according to science? 4.5 billion. 4.5 billion, that's, that's one. 
And then um, there are, for example, there are Christian schools where when you take science in that school, you don't learn that. They believe the, earth, the creation is about a few thousand years old. That's it. Because they add up all the years in the Bible and say, okay, that's our science book. We need to go by that and forget all this stuff. It, it just all happened all not, that, all not that long ago. And so if there's a fossil in the ground that looks like it's three million years old. Not really. It just means that God created fossils. God said, oh, I'm gonna make a fossil here. Okay. What do you think about it? Do we have to reject science in order to believe God's way? I feel like there's like believing in reality. I mean, like some things are like, I mean, I believe he did create some stuff, but I don't believe I don't think you have to reject the science. I think you kind of have to be in between. You can't like be with one or other. If you want to like know either, you kind of have to like kind of bend the rules of science. Like I mean, sometimes it's just hard to imagine. It is. This is gonna be one of those things that blows your mind because you're gonna, you know, remember what I said about ten years from now? Ten years from now. We're going to have theories that we don't even have now. Because, like, did he, it's like reality, did he create, does he choose what happens to people, or is that just reality? Kind of same. Did he create the world, is that reality or something? Or is that same, same sort of question again. Did you find anything out, Xander? Well, the other thing, you know, when you, when you read the stories in the Bible, it's a very earth-centered story, you know, so, so it talks about everything God did for the earth. So when you read about science, though, then you realize about astronomy, and the earth is just kind of like a little speck here, and it, it really does kind of blow your mind. And because of that, some scientists reject religion. They say, oh, those religious people are crazy. Just forget all about that. Yes, sir? Um, I didn't know what? I didn't know what? Oh, okay. I thought you had some more information. Um, but, but other people have... He, he, let me just tell you what works for me. This is a little simplistic, Michael, but tell me if it makes sense to you. Is, and that is when I, when I get my science book... It helps me understand the question how when I get my Bible, it helps me understand who and why. Okay? So, personally, I don't have any problem with the idea that the universe is however many billions of years old and that that the universe was around a long, long time before human beings ever came along. That doesn't make me believe less in God. It makes me believe more in God, actually, because it just blows my mind. It's like, wow, when you think about all of the planets and all of the stars and all of the universes, the different aspects of the universe, I almost said universes, all the different um, aspects of the universe, it just makes me feel like, wow, Lord, you're bigger than I can even imagine. So when I pick up the Bible, I don't have to turn it into a, um, an alternative science, if you will. But I want you to be aware there are people that do, okay? So at this point, you might get into more arguments with Christians than you do with atheists. Because some Christians are going to get kind of extreme on some of their theories. 
that go against what we believe about science. Um, but in, in our church family and in my tradition, that's just not a, not a big deal to worry about, okay? So try to be patient with people who are atheists and try to be patient with people who are maybe a little bit over the top Christian there. Um, kind of works both ways. And, and I hope you can kind of keep your head on straight and focus on the things that really, really help you. So when I read the story about the Bible, the things that were created in God, creating human beings, I just say thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you made this beautiful earth, that you made sun, moon, and stars, all of creation, and that I have a place in it, and I'm still trying to figure out how and when it all happened, and that my little life means something special to you, even in the middle of all the things that I can barely begin, begin to understand there. Okay? Does that help a little bit? Okay, what questions do you have? Question about God or about our church compared to other churches? Yes. Okay, what is the difference in Methodist and Baptist? Difference between Methodist and Baptist. I grew up having to understand that because in Texas there are a lot of Baptists, okay? Um, if you divide up Christianity, there's the Catholic Church. There are a lot of churches called Orthodox Church. We don't see them much around here because they're related to places like Turkey and Russia and places like that. But there are a few of them there. And then there's a whole bunch of churches that are kind of like independent or, or, or um, Protestant, we sometimes call that. That would include Methodist, Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostal, and all of those. And all of those churches, we have a lot of things in common but there's also some differences. The biggest difference, first of all, most Baptist churches are independent. That means this church and this pastor can kind of do it this way. So you might find one Baptist church that does this and one Baptist church that does something else. So we're kind of, we're kind of missing the point anyway when we say that because they're gonna be kind of different. But most Baptist churches do believe that um, they, they tend to see the Bible a little bit differently, which is that the Bible was dictated by God. In other words, God put all the words on the page. So just accept it and go with it and don't question it. That's the way it comes across to me sometimes. Is that fair, Miss Karen? Kind of, kind of, kind of, um, um, sort of a strict interpretation of the Bible. Most Methodists, not all, most Methodists believe that um, God was present with the people who wrote the Bible, but it also has human influence too. So, so sometimes you'll read one part of one Bible that says God felt this, and you'll read something else, God felt something else. It makes it sound like God's confused, but then you realize, well, that's normal. Because people today still have different ideas about God, right? Why wouldn't people have had different ideas back then as well? They weren't magic. They weren't any more magic than we were. They're trying to write down their understanding of God for us. And the Bible helps us understand how God works. But it's not a magic book at all. Baptist, um, um, generally you have to be Baptized in their church to be baptized. If I, I love Baptist people, I got a lot of friends, but if I decided to go to a Baptist church, they'd say, Pastor Robert, you've been a Christian for all these years, but you need to be baptized in our church. They wouldn't accept the baptism I did. But I would have to kind of do it, do it that way. Um, Baptists also do not baptize babies. You have to be a certain, there's like an age requirement. So that's another reason my baptism wouldn't work because I was a baby when I was baptized. And that that's, wouldn't be good enough in their book because they believe in um, baptism of those who are older. They also believe you have to be put under the water. So that's one of the 
Another reason my baptism wouldn't work, because I had water poured on my head, so I didn't get enough water, I was the wrong age, and it took place in the wrong church. So it's kind of like three strikes I'm out <laughs> on, on that there. Um, but that's, that's fine, that's just, you know, maybe they're right and we're wrong, but it's just a different way of looking at it. Um, they're a lot more strict on the role of, of men and women in the church. This is very much certain roles are left only to the men. Um, one of the interesting things about the Baptist church is, you remember, you remember when I asked the question about does God offer his love to everybody or are some just chosen? Remember that question? Uh, well, Baptists kind of agree with Methodists at that point, that God's love is offered to everybody. Most Baptists will agree with that. Um, however, they do believe that if you become a Christian when you're five years old or nine years old or a hundred years old, um, now you can never leave. It's kind of like you are in. So... Um, it's that like, sounds scary. Well, they, they <laughs> like it. They like it because what they call, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm really trying not to make it sound bad, but it's different. No, yeah, no, I don't think you're making it sound bad. It just sounds like scary. Like What they call it is security. So that you will know, no matter how messed up your life gets, you know, say I'm 30 years old and I've been divorced 14 times and on drugs. And, but if I was baptized when I was nine, I'm going to heaven. My life may be messed up, but I'm going to heaven. Because when I was nine, I said yes to Jesus. If I did that honestly, that means nobody can take that away from me no matter how screwed up I get. Okay? So... Um, the only difference is that, um, now here's the tricky part. Imagine that same story. I got baptized when I was nine, now I'm 30, and I've been divorced 14 times, and I'm on drugs, and I'm out of money, and I'm stealing to support my habits. And then you ask me, Robert, I thought you were baptized when you were nine. What's going on in your life? And you say, I just don't believe that stuff anymore. Well, what's my Baptist pastor going to tell me? First of all, they're going to, hopefully they're going to tell me, now wait a minute, you really meant that, didn't you? And then I might say, oh, I was just nine, I didn't know what I was doing. There may come a point that my Baptist preacher friend will say, well, you know, you really weren't honest in the first place. So you really weren't going to heaven in the first place. So you probably need to get baptized again because obviously it didn't work. You see what I mean? Because yeah. um, now, now if, I, if, I, if I did answer the question, say, um, Pastor Joe, um, yeah, I know I messed up, but please pray for me. I still love the Lord. He's not going to make me get baptized again. But if I say, eh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just nine years old. He's probably going to tell me I need to get baptized again because it was like it wasn't authentic. Okay. So in one sense, you can say our Baptist friends believe you have some security. That's what they call it. They call it you have security because you've accepted Christ. So nothing can take you away from him. Um. And they would look at us Methodists and say, well, why on earth would you want to believe that? Why would you want to believe that you don't have security? What we believe is that we have freedom. And I have freedom as a nine-year-old to give my life to Jesus. But I have freedom when I get older to walk away and choose a different life. It's not because God doesn't want me back. In fact, God told the, Jesus told a story about the guy who had two sons, and one of them stayed at home, and one of them cashed it in and left. But the father never gave up on the son, but he let him go. Do you remember that story, prodigal son? He let him go, 
But then when he came, when he realized his problem, he welcomed him back home. That's kind of like a picture of what God does to us. He gives us the freedom to kind of go mess up. He's not going to nail us down. He's not going to put us in a dungeon. It's like, Reed, you belong to me. And since you're trying to get away, I'm going to lock you up so you don't get away. I love you so much, but I'm going to lock you up. Well, that's not exactly love, isn't it? You know, God's going to say, Reed, man, I love you, but you know, you've decided to go off and live this crazy life. I'm not going to give up on you, but I give you the freedom to do that, and I hope you'll never forget. I hope you'll come home. So that's how we believe God works. But it is a little bit different, because our Baptist friends will talk about that security that you have no matter, no matter what. Most Methodist Bible studies, if you get 10 people, the leader's not going to say, here's what the Bible says and here's what you have to believe. We're going to open the Bible and we're going to say, what do you see? What do you see? So we kind of learn from each other because one might see something that somebody else doesn't see. Does that make sense? Does that help? What else, Baptists and Methodists? Um, one, one thing you cannot say is that one particular church's church services are one style and one church's are different because there are um, church styles of all kinds as Methodists and there are church styles of all kinds as Baptists. So when, when I was growing up, that wasn't so much the case. So if you went to a Methodist church, it kind of felt like this. And if you went to a Baptist church, it kind of felt like this. And they were similar, but a little different. But now, there's so many, I call it flavors of church, that if you go to five different Methodist churches and five different Baptist churches, you might say, well, this one was kind of like this, and this one was kind of like this. In other words, some churches are very quiet, I was having a conversation about this with a guy the other day. Um, some people, life is crazy and they come to church to settle down. And they like a peaceful church. Some people, church, a life has got people dragged down and they come to church and want to be pumped up. So some church services you go to are going to feel mostly peaceful. Some church services you can go to are going to feel mostly, almost like a football game, get you pumped up, like a rally to kind of get you going. And bless our heart, my, my last church in Texas, we actually had two church services that were different. One had an organ and choir people and robes, and one had guitar and drums and all that kind of stuff. Because some people like one thing and one, some people like another thing. So um, anymore, I don't think you can talk about, well, Methodist church feels this way and Baptist church feels this way because there's way too many differences on that. But that used to be a thing. Um, if you ever hear Pentecostal churches, that is a different thing. Pentecostal churches and some independent churches believe in what's called speaking in tongues. You ever heard that one? You ever heard of speaking in tongues, Court? Okay. So the Bible talks a little bit about speaking in tongues, not a lot, but it's, a, it's an experience that might happen when I'm praying by myself, something I've never done, but I've heard it done, where one minute I'm kind of praying in English, and the next minute it just sounds like, oh, 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 oh like no words to it. And it's somebody who feels so close to God, the closeness is too strong for words. I said it might happen when I'm praying by myself, but it might also happen at church. So in a Pentecostal church, that probably happens a lot. And this is a huge difference where people, some people believe, you know, if you're going to be a Christian, that needs to happen to you. Because that means you have God's spirit. 
So for them, they believe that is the sign of God's Spirit. Here, here's an interesting difference between Pentecostal, Methodist, and Baptist. Okay, bear with me for a minute here. A lot of Pentecostal believe you've got to have this happen to you. Now, you can't make it happen because it's kind of like an explosion in your heart. You see what I mean? Then it's sort of like, boom, you know, it sort of comes out without you knowing it. Um, <clears throat> most of our Baptist church friends, honestly, they believe that's over and done with. So a lot of them don't even much like the idea of speaking in tongues now. They think that's sort of an old time thing. Here again, Methodists are kind of in the middle because we will say that's not required, but if God has you speak in tongues, fine. You know? And that's kind of what the Bible says that says some people speak in tongues or pray in tongues, languages or unknown languages, and some don't because God's Spirit is different for everyone. So I really like what our church teaches on that. I don't like the idea that we should say that's over and done with. But I don't like the idea of saying that's what a true Christian is. So if you ever get a chance to visit a Pentecostal church, bring somebody you love with you so you can talk about it afterward. But be prepared. Remember I said some churches are kind of quiet and some are like a rally. Well, Pentecostal is going to be like a rally. You're going to have an experience there. That's just like awkward. Like, I don't know. No. Yeah. And I don't, I honestly don't know. I went to a Christian concert the other night at uh -huh. a Baptist church, and it was like a rally, and I was like, <laughs> Some of the people, like, they had their hands raised, oh, okay, like, okay. tears running down yes, their yes. face, yeah. jumping up and down. I was like, oh, this is awkward. So, <laughs> you didn't catch it? You didn't quite no. catch it? Like, I was standing up, but, like, yeah. they were jumping around dancing. Okay, and that's not necessarily speaking, they weren't speaking in tongues, but they were getting into it. Right? Yeah, they were dancing. Yeah, yeah, so. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that's again, that's more like the different styles there. And, and when we went to, a few years ago, we went to a resurrection conference in Gatlinburg. Um, that was a Methodist conference, but it's pretty pumped up, you know. So sometimes youth events are a little more with it than old people events, you know. What can I say? Yes, sir. What's Easter Sunday? Easter Sunday is April the 17th. Yes, so it's like four weeks from today. Yes, sir. You ever mentioned the differences with the Catholic, Anglican, and Episcopal churches? That seems like a really long conversation. Yeah. Here, here. Or it could be. We'll make it a we'll make it a short answer. One of the one of the huge differences with the Catholic Church is the value that they put on communion. They call it the mass. So most Methodist and Baptist churches, we take communion, but not always every Sunday. And it's like, it's special to us. It's probably more special for Methodists than Baptists. But for Catholics, that's like a really big deal because they believe that's where you receive Jesus himself, okay? And um, most Catholic churches will have a piece of bread like up on a table um, and they keep like one extra piece of bread and kind of put it up there and they say, that's the body of Jesus. That is Jesus. And so you are extremely respectful when you do that. I took a confirmation class in Longview, Texas to go visit a Catholic church. And the lady was giving us a tour, and she said, she told these little Methodist kids, when you go through that door, you be quiet, because Jesus is in there. Well, they kind of went, okay, well, they, they kind of took that seriously. So, so that's a really big deal. For, and, and also in the Catholic, if you ever go to church with a Catholic friend, you're really not supposed to take communion. 
If you ever go to a church with a Baptist friend, you're probably not supposed to take communion either because they do it just for them. In the Methodist church, guess what? You don't have to be an insider to take communion. So if you bring a friend to our church, they can sit or they can take, but it's up to them. We don't leave anybody out. We call that the open, open table. Yeah. So that's kind of a big deal. The family tree of Methodist comes through the Anglican or Episcopal church, which is the Church of England, and the Methodists kind of came off of that. So Methodists started in England and then came to America. Um, but Methodist, Methodist, here's how I would put it, because you grew up Episcopal church, right? No. Uh, when it comes to our beliefs, Episcopal and Methodist are not hugely different. When it comes to the flavor of the church, it has changed. They're a little bit more on the peaceful side, and we're a little more, well, we're not exactly like a rally, but we're a little more casual. Would that be a fair way to put it um, there? That would be so awkward to see, like, the people in our church jumping around. Like, that's just weird. Well, it would be God at work. Yeah, it would be God at work. Y'all, oh, we need to get Winky here sometime, and she will tell about when some Jesus people started coming to this church about 40 years ago. We need to have that. Hey, girls. Good to see y'all. Imagine going the other direction and having the whole service in Latin. Yeah, when I, was, when I was little, if you went to a Catholic church, it wasn't even in English. It wasn't even in English. They would read everything in another language. It's like, they didn't care as long as they got their mass, you know, but now it's in their own language. I didn't even talk about one of the huge differences of opinion among Christians today, and I shouldn't even bring it up except we talk about it all the time, is what place we give to LGBT people. Um, that is a huge point of disagreement in churches today because some of them um, are say, well, would say, you know, well, God created everybody. God's love is for everybody. We need to live that out. Other people would say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't tell a man to marry a man or a woman to marry a man, woman, so forget about that. You don't have any place here. And once again, Methodists have not yet resolved all of this because Methodist opinions are really in both places. That's all I can say about that for right now. So I, I would encourage you... I'd be glad to have further discussion with you about that if you have questions. But in our church family and in Methodist as a whole, you have different opinions on that. Okay? So that's, that's, that's something our society has changed so fast on that um, a lot of people are still trying to figure it out. One thing we definitely say and always have is that all people are welcome at our church. We would not exclude anybody. So if you had a gay friend, you would never have to worry about inviting them to come to our church. If they wanted to become a member of our church, we'd be happy to welcome them. I can, I can tell you that much for sure. But as far as the opinions, we're still working on that one. Okay. Any other questions? Um... So what I'll be doing, I will be letting you know in the near future, we're going to have to find a time that we can have kind of a one-on-one -on -one talk and just make sure kind of where you are in your faith journey. And maybe you already know, which is fine. Maybe you aren't quite sure. And so um, kind of make those last plans for confirmation day. Those who've never been baptized have an opportunity to be baptized. One thing we don't do is baptize over. So if you're baptized... It's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. But you can renew your baptism. One way we do that, I'm like, Landon, you've already been baptized, right? So on confirmation day, we'll still have a bowl of water. And so like if you could come forward, you could take the water and put it on your head as a reminder of the gift. But I'm not going to pour water on your head and say, now you are baptized. Because somebody already did that. So we don't, we don't redo that. But we can't. We don't redo, but we can renew. 
hear the difference. We don't redo, but we can redo. Well, see, you keep using the same prefix. And re, exactly. And they rhyme with each other. That's actually a, a prefix. Yes, R-E is the prefix. Okay, I'm going to